so uh, good evening one and all present here it's my honor to be your host this evening on behalf of uh, swadhyay sachakra vishwanidan center for asian blue jamming uh, puducherry and chennai it's my honor to welcome our distinguished speaker of the evening dr uh, umar nizaruddin sir uh, from university of calicut sir is a versatile personality and uh, definitely a very kind hearted who accepted our invitation to be uh, the chief speaker this evening so i welcome you sir i also welcome uh, professor anand giri sir uh, who is uh, the moderator of the session as well as a source of motivation for us i welcome minati pradhan ji and all the distinguished participants from different corner of the world uh, we are happy to have you this evening on the occasion of this webinar on the very uh, important topic uh, that is radical immersion bhakti as ethical medium in contemporary india very relevant topic so uh, it's really very relevant topic and uh, i am reminded of one line of uh, sanskrit dharayati iti dharma means any conduct any practice which is adoptable to all of us without harming others is dharma so if dharma is not affecting others in negative terms definitely it should be uh, acceptable it should be incorporated in our day to day life and it will become a guide for us like basic principles of dharma like satya truth tap penance daya compassion charity daan so if these principles we adopt from any religion irrespective of any religion uh, which exists in in the entire world so definitely there will be no conflict but the moment some radical practices radical behaviors are there definitely that create conflicts and disturbs the equilibrium of the society so on this very topic we have an expert among us dr umar so before inviting our distinguished speaker of the evening i would like to invite professor anand giri sir to moderate the session and after him i'll invite the distinguished speaker so over to you professor giri so thank you so much dear dr devendra and a warm welcome to dr umar dear dr umar and all friends who are present in this beautiful evening today and today is also the full moon night in odisha we celebrate it as kumar purnima and that celebrates the youth the creative youth of women people as men so today's topic bhakti as radical immersion and as an ethical medium in contemporary india is a deeply significant thing and dr umar is a very creative thinker and creative seeker that are and he is exploring so many uh, related domains of thinking and understanding and in this paper he moves so creatively across bhakti traditions and the psychoanalytic thoughts of lacan and philosophical streams of derrida and coming from kerala and uh, dr umar also has a deep immersion in the universal the deeply universally significant thought traditions of kerala namely sri narayana devi so bhakti as an ethical medium it brings us what is ethics ethics is the web of our relationships so bhakti as ethical media this itself brings us 
to a board of bhakti which is manifest in the relationships between self and other, self and nature, self and divine. I have been a student of the spiritual movement called Swadhyaya, which has been working in Western India. And in Swadhyaya, one of the energizing theme is Bhakti is a social force. And the tradition of bhakti in India, for example, in medieval India, or let us say, when, when the category of medieval is limited, because this whole category of modern, medieval, and ancient, it is a production of European colonial construction of the world. But in this time, 700, 800 years ago, the whole flow of the bhakti movement, it really opened up Indian society and it critiqued existing structures of domination. And this critique was possible because of the border crossing radical confluence that happened, for example, bhakti tradition and Sufism and the radical, you know, this, the, the vision of radical equality in Islam. And it is none other than Gandhi who has said that Islam is one where everybody under that is treated equally. Of course, there is a great deal of a gap between vision and practice. And Islam as a religion is not immune from that limitation of the gap. But this border crossing between Sufism and, uh, and Bhakti movement has been one deeply ethical medium in contemporary India. The other thing is that Bhakti as a mode of practice and that mode of practice, it constitutes the future that is waiting to be born. My teacher and respected thinker, Professor J.P.S. Ubra used to say that India would be modern when India would realize the potential of the bhakti. So with these few thoughts, I welcome all of you to this uh, you know, presentation by Dr. Umar. And also, we have been blessed to have Dr. Medha with us. So Dr. Medha, welcome, please. I invite you to kindly now, open up your video if possible. Dr. Medha. Okay, now Dr. Medha is joining us a little later. Dr. Medha, are you there? Okay. Uh, Dr. Medha will join after 20 minutes. Okay. So at that time, Randhi, uh, you would uh, present a little introduction to her. So now, Dr. Umar, please. You may like to, if it is okay, around 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, sir. It's okay, Professor Giri. It's perfectly all right. Yes. Around 25 minutes, please. So, welcome. Thank you so much, Professor Anantakumar Giri and Professor Dravindra Tivadri. So, I am privileged to be here at the Vishunidam Center for Asian Blossoming. It's indeed a wonderful opportunity for me to present before such an august audience. My paper is academic in nature and it goes against the principles of bhakti to speak in academic language. Kindly bear with me. My paper is titled Radical Immersion, Bhakti as Ethical Medium in Contemporary India. Bhakti is the early modern efflorescence of poetic and spiritual creativity that nourished the Indic ecosystem of ethical thinking. In contemporary times, the tradition of bhakti devotionalism informs the immersive crafting of media in India. The bhakti poet or sant offers her gloss interpretation on life, even as it is lived and critiqued. A person can live life or critique life, but bhakti at the same time allows a person to live life and critique life at the same time. She is immersed, not embedded, 
within the devotional space of life. Catherine Malabu criticizes the Lacanian concept of the mirror as a metaphor for screen-based media, like television, mobile phone. The screen, when conceived as a closed off mirror reflection, is enchanted by what lies outside its four corners. And this necessitates an inside-outside dichotomy that reproduces binaries. Like Satyajit Rai's films are informed by what lies outside. But the bhakti conception of media posits its tradition within the mediated space. It is self-contained as in the dictum Vasudeva Kudumbakam. This sustaining social media interaction without fatigue or burnout as a result of an immersive, non-alienating, or permeating tradition, the hitherto invasive valences of the medium metamorphose into a non-dualistic at all encompassing mobilizing center of gravity that engenders a spectral spectatorial subjectivity. Because the argument against bhakti sometimes is that it goes against the principle of Advaita. It is Dvaita. There is the devotee and there is deity. But the subject of bhakti is a holistic gestalt Salman Rushdie, in his magnum opus, Midnight's Children, envisages the All India Radio as the all-encompassing technological ether which magically imbues the Indic model. The decentered center of the bhakti media is an enchanted world or vortex of spectral subjectivity. This hold subjectivity and multi-dimensionality of bhakti lends itself to futuristic mediations with the immersive technology of self. The Tamil bhaktas were called arvars who were immersed in bhakti. It, is virtu it virtually presents a linear, unidirectional modernity within its cyclical temporality. Bhakti as an embodied doctrine of vibration finds itself compatible with the radical spectrality of virtual media. It can be considered as an internal critique and a challenge that is offered to power structures. While visiting early modern bhakti, it can be discerned to have provided multiple points of view, plural ontologies and complex modes of association with the DT. According to the media studies scholar Bill Nichols, in a narrative frame, a historical personage like Mahatma Gandhi takes on a mythical function. This can be found in movies like Meera 1945, starring Emma Subbalakshmi, where bhakti constitutes the content as well as the form through which Mirabai, the legendary figure, is elevated to a mythical function. Even as bhakti formally serves its gnostic, self-contained healing function vis-a-vis -vis sensory overload in the medium. In its contemporary iteration, Bhakti as an ethic of radical responsibility formally attains the valences of an ethical unconscious medium in the Indian context. The medieval bhakti poetry of India is an enduring repository of literary works that project peculiar tropes such as repetitions, parallelisms, mirroring, polyglossia, subversion, and disruptions, slesha, bitextuality, that use the intellectual love of God, yani bhakti, as an emptying of religion rather than a turning loose of it. 
the variegated in form the bhakti movement was pan indian in its spread and influence in south india poets like manikya vachakar bowed wept danced and cried aloud according to shelling in a largely shaivite idiom that built upon the classical edifice of akam inside and puram outside not just in south india but throughout the matrix of bhakti in the indian subcontinent kerala also had a special place having produced many of its pioneering sages and personages including the great sri narayana guru whom professor giri kindly mentioned just now in kerala a region with traditions of rama bhakti and krishna bhakti it was the adi shankaracharya who lived from 788 to 820 christian era who proposed a monistic philosophy advaita in his works and initiated the bhakti movement through his poems such as nirvana shatakam cherushir nambudri who lived from 1375 to 1475 ce and tunjut eltachen who lived from 1495 to 1575 ce and pudanam nambudri who lived from 1547 to 1640 ce were the exemplars of bhakti movement in kerala which combined the great tradition of sanskrit with the little tradition of local folk culture seamlessly slavoj zizek is a lakanian scholar his theory holds unexplored possibilities in the study of bhakti poetry the bhakti movement originated in the 7th century in tamil nadu the bhakti its self is as old as the bhagavad gita where lord krishna says bhava mad bhakto be my devotee the immersivity of bhakti is its salient feature the etymological root of bhakti is the sanskrit verb bhaj which means to divide share or distribute bhakti came to mean to partake enjoy participate to eat to make love from such concrete roots it went on to take abstract meanings such as to experience to adore to serve honor or worship bhakti movement was pan indian in nature and sons and sages and monks from various geographic regions of india belonging to different sects or even religions practicing divergent rituals and speaking different languages and it behaving in an almost identical manner in their approach to god bhakti holistically imbued the civilizational ethos of the indic people irrespective of creed the dominating note is that of ecstasy a longing for union with god and to merge one's identity in the godhead bhakti movement in south india and elsewhere was characterized by a hydraulic absurge in fervor for union with god by a long suffering medieval populace that sought to escape the chains of whimsical monarchy in union with the godhead in the writings of kabir in the godhead merged gods of different religions castes classes and genders hence god became not the big other of ideology but the levinasian other whose face is the chasm between the self and the other for the french psychoanalyst lacan desire is the other's desire unification with the beloved which is so violent annihilating and traumatic the earliest tamil bhakti poems by tiputala who lived in 250 ce were addressed to lord shiva murugan or the red one identified with shiva the bhakti experience is one in which in wagnerian gazam kunstwork fashion melody rhythm dance visualization poetry are techniques of ecstasy bhakti is a total immersion and a manifestation of transpositional subject objectivity i hope this concept to the ideas of professor giri these threshold bhakti poets were shamans who foregrounded dance and ritual 
the tradition of bhakti poetry in south india was taken forward by arvar the immersed poets antal 9th century nammalwar and the veera shaiva poets dasimayya allama prabhu basavanna and akka mahadevi the genesis qua i don't know supplement in a person that propels love or hatred towards the other is the objepati a and it is the same term of endearment chenna sweet used by akka mahadevi as she calls shiva her sweet malligarjuna or lord white as jasmine combining the local kannada idiom and the sanskrit terminology according to basavanna giving back light one becomes a mirror and his mirror is the eating bowl of daily sustenance according to ekaram manujan basavanna is a master of anaphora the winnowing fan is a god the pot is a god the stone in the street is a god and there is only one god our god of the meeting rivers there are also inverse parallels such as a snake charmer and his noseless wife and the noseless woman and her snake charming husband the inversion representing the encounter with the mirror image of the self as the other according to ekaramanuj Zizek, the Slovenian thinker whom I mentioned before, points out that beneath beneath this mirror image of the neighbor that I have created in my own self image lurks the infinite abyss of otherness. In Bhakti poetry, this abyss and proximity are two sides of a coin, or two rhyming beats in a couplet. they are both immersed in the divine ether of bhakti devotion propagated through vernacular languages such as malayalam tamil kannada marathi etc the monistic doctrine of advaita or non dualism unity of atman and nirguna brahman was established by shankaracharya born in kaldi in kerala he also wrote commentaries on the upanishads bhagavad gita and brahma shastra sometimes called the thomas aquinas of indian thought though i consider such colonial terminologies improper he sought to establish unity between various sects of religion through syncretic ritual in his nirvana shatakam shankara says that i am thought i am joy i am shiva him number 3 the bhakti movement later found its proponents in kerala in cherusheri tunjuttu elthachin and poondana who are still considered the greatest poets of malayalam language the bhakti movement in kerala lacked the religious and social synthesizing function it had to the north of india it was a syncretic combination of sanskrit language works and local dravidian tradition the emergence of modern malayalam language in kerala is connected to the bhakti movement and its immersive function which allowed the subaltern groups to become part of a wider mediated public sphere of devotion the sanskrit etymological origin of purism belies the syncretism of bhakti as we know it today like most other surviving remnants of pre colonial past that still exist in modern india like caste like religion bhakti also has acquired the status of being a colonial construct the existence of a bhakti textuality and community of bhakti that predates the colonial era refute this claim orientalist writers like grierson monie williams and albrecht weber along with h h wilson try to create a monotheistic biblical analog of christianity in bhakti wilson for instance categorized the gaudiya sampradaya inspired by chaitanya mahaprabhu as bhakti being oblivious to the existence of other sampradayas albrecht weber and lorenzio recast krishna devotion as bhakti religion with the bhagavad gita as its scripture but they did not consider the immersive nature of bhakti as an all encompassing media bhakti had an affective valence 
for its devotional community of ascetics and bhaktas. The emotional intensity of bhakti rendered hierarchical orders as unnecessary and irrational. Bhakti was an assemblage where every actor in the network had equal value and significance. Bhakti as emotion. Holly has suggested that the notion of a bhakti movement is a cultural stepchild of the nationalist movement and dates to perhaps no earlier than the fourth decade of the last century. Indeed, it has been convincingly argued that the idea of a coherent movement of to Sri Hazari Prasad Dwayti Ji's translation of Grayerson's notion of bhakti as a religious revolution into the Hindi phrase bhakti andolan. There is evidence of a self-consciousness of bhakti being a unique religious idea with a specific chronological and geographical progression from about the early 18th century. Bharati Jagannathan says this. There were canonical anthologies of early Tamil bhakti poetry collected in separate volumes of Shaivite and Vaishnavite bhakti poetry, Tirumurai and Nalaira Divya Prabantham. Though love and valor were the values of the heroic age, bhakti conceived of a love different from the patriarchal expression of love within the family structure. Bhakti set in motion a feminine expression in art and poetry. Bhakti, unlike Jainism and Buddhism, is a surrender of the heart and not an intellectual compassion. The rise on the earth cause of bhakti was the unbridled unleashing of the powers of the human heart. It espoused Parama Prema Surupa or ultimate love. In Tirupavai, the Bhakti Sant Andal asked for ghee and pongal and worldly goods. Bhakti was not a negation of eros or love, but its extension. It did not espouse Vairagya. It embraced life in all its facets. For this reason, Bhakti can encompass a spectrum of emotions from medieval darshan to present-day Bollywood. Bhakti functions as an ether of disparate sensibilities that are focused solely upon emotional intensity. One can track the career of the word bhakti through a staggering number of ways, from the earliest oral narratives to the latest Bollywood films, from individual engagement with a deity in a moment of virtual contact, darshan, to the imagination of a unified yet heterogeneous nation, according to Christine Lee Novetsky. All human emotions were accommodated within bhakti. It was an end in itself and not the means to something else, according to Utpaladeva, who wrote Shiva Strotravali in the 11th century CE. In Vaishnavite bhakti, this experience of the here and now is through Krishna Leela or the divine playfulness. In Shaivite Bhakti, the same is channeled through the cosmic dance of Shiva. The difference between Vaishnavite and Shaivite imagination is that the Vaishnavite imagination is melodic, since melody is a linear phenomenon, whereas Shaivite imagination is rhythmic. The sound of the Damaru or the drum is the template of Shaivite rhythmic imagination. The coexistence of beauty and terror can be found in Shaivite Bhakti. This sort of complexity can be accommodated within Shaivite imagination. The five cosmic functions of the Supreme Being are Srishti, Creation, Palana, Nourishment, Protection, Nasha, Destruction, Tirodhana, Disappearance, and Anugraha, Blessing. Transformation in rituals and elsewhere, though Bhakti abhors ritual, is achieved through divine grace by energy transformation. There is no linearity or contiguity in this transformation. It is instant and takes place in the here and now, like Zen, Satori. Bhakti assures you no material gain. It embodies undivided bliss, not cut off from the cosmic truth.
in the narada bhakti sutra it is said that wherever my devotees are singing and dancing i am there art and poetry are not just about bhakti or means to express bhakti such channels of dissemination of emotion and data like art and poetry are the very essence of bhakti in the poetry of the tamil vaishnavite sant andal a merging of two major currents of indian life the aryan and the dravidian can be found in the chilapathigaram krishna as a deity makes his first appearance in tamil the entire ecosystem of the brindavan is transposed to tamil nadu in his work by ilango adigal krishna wields the spear of the whale which is the weapon of choice for the predominantly tamil deity murugan the brindavan turns into a vaishnavite utopia krishna also turns into a player of drums rather than the flute in the tirupavai the pre bhakti ritual of pavai is transformed into a vaishnavite bhakti ritual the tirupavai has eloquent evocations of the rains and here it merges krishna with indra the deity associated with rain the poem spatially reaches for poetic depth as well as for mystical cosmic altitude water dominates the south indian imagination since the fields were rain fed in the absence of a full fledged irrigation system or river network but the aryan imagination was more fiery and paid obeisance to fire or agni bhakti this was not a complete repudiation of ritual there are also exclusive references to musical instruments in medieval bhakti especially drums cymbals and percussion instruments these are used in the soteriological function of ritual music according to beck the pre bhakti sangam elements of ancient tamil poetry made their way into bhakti sangam poetry had the binary of agam and puram inside and outside evoking love and war these two streams came together in bhakti poetry shaivite bhakti also contains grotesque elements like the aura of cremation grounds the tamil term for both forest and cremation ground is the same term kaadu there is no outside to bhakti so to speak it is all encompassing and immersive in its mediational valence bhakti poetry could belong either to margi classical great or the deshi folk little tradition it could also constitute a separate genre of its own ekramanujan suggests that bhakti comprised not a synthesis of margi and deshi traditions rather he suggests bhakti comprised an anti establishment to the establishment of little and great bhakti in the southern part of india where it took roots was philosophical and popular it combined the ethical doctrine of advaita and the ethics of work culture kayagave kailasa the immense beauty devotional intensity and simplicity of kannada and tamil and malayalam verses made them popular the linguistic configuration of southern indian ethos was aided by the dissemination of bhakti the traversal of enlightened ideas of egalitarianism made bhakti a medium bhakti was not the organic edifice which it appears to be in hindsight not all vajanakaras were branches of the same tree or rivers flowing into the same ocean nor were they all bent upon caste and social reform for the great kannada scholar nagraj the old one out is allama prabhu akka mahadevi and basavanna were proponents of old fashioned bhakti conventional bhakti but allama's verses had that elusive esoteric quality and they were syncretic in a way that would have appalled surendranath das gupta but both allama and basavanna find common ground in devotional symbolism and reformist zeal that was inclusive in the propagation of its message of egalitarianism here i would like to ask for the moderator's permission before continuing yes please <laughs> so maybe another uh, you know four five minutes is it okay okay professor giri thank you so much for that yes. from the time of kindly continue thank you <laughs> 
In the time of King Bhoja, 11th century CE, who composed the Sringara Prakash, Sringara was the rasa that was used to express devotional, mystical experiences and ecstasy. Since Bhakti as a rasa had not emerged or garnered the heft, it later did. The remainder of Indic thought was absorbed by the new rasa, Bhakti. For instance, it was against this structural deficiency that Allama rebelled in his words. I quote, the elders went to the pond on the hill with the onion of the absolute. They are trying to make a curry. The hill cannot boil. The curry cannot be cooked. And hence, there can be no offering. Allama Prabhu, Allama Vachana Chandrike. The metaphor of the onion stands for the sensual order of rasa theory. The hill, of course, is shyvite and the allusions are elliptical. Allama also later alludes to poets as parrots, repeating verses learned by rote memory without registering their meaning, worth or sense. Bhakti in its all inclusivity also encompassed post-human, non-human elements like geographical landscapes. For the Vajanakaras of Kannad, nothing not even the Upanishad were deemed worthwhile, but for their philosophical and devotional intensity. The Vajanakaras abandoned complex forms such as the Champu for folk modes of common lay expression. Bhakti as an immersive media was not a complex amalgam of conflicting opposites, but a simple, sweet doctrine of love devotion and light. Nagaraj movingly speaks of a Veera Shaiva memory which was kept alive as a novel idiom of creative production that departed from a non-devotional mode of writing to a more comprehensive and organic one that also included the devotional mode within its ambit. The Vachanas were in conflict with the monarchy and monastical clergy the popularization of their philosophy was an unfinished project, hints of which can be gleaned from the scholarly office of Nagaraj. The revolutionary media of Bhakti enabled the mass movement led by Basava. I quote, when Siddharama, 12th century, describes language as important, he is really speaking for the majority of Vajnakaras of his time. But his profound doubt does not discourage them from exploring the resources that language has at its command. Allama Prabhu ascribes to human language a basic quality, the ability to narrate. If contemporary Western language theory reflects on language's fundamental metaphoricity, Allama Prabhu focuses on another equally important trait, the narrative instinct. The Vachanakara's distrust of formal rhetoric was also quite deep-seated. It was a rejection of both the context and text that the previous or dominant literary culture had produced. This shows that the major poets of the movement were aware of the pedagogical training that goes into the making of poetry. They simply chose not to write in those modes. It was an ethical choice. The soul of Bhakti was its simplicity, which through lyrical modes proliferated spatially and temporally in the South. Southern Bhakti verses, such as those of Sri Basava, are known for their simplicity. But yet, he was not averse to the occasional polemical argument, often acquiring the tone of a politician prophet. This is crucial since the Veera Shivas regarded the Tamil Shivas or the nine Mars as their predecessors. Same features are discernible in Tamil Bhakti poetry as well. Perhaps due to the class composition of his following, Sri Basavanna was a proponent of a distinctly spiritual work ethic, which called work worship Kayakave Kailasa. He was also less dogmatic. What Kabir was to Northern Bhakti, Basava was for the Southern Bhakti. Basavanna fundamentally altered the way religion, labor, and deity were perceived in South India. Basava, with his zest of a social reformer and the zeal of a prophet, caught in the net of practical politics, 
was not a perfect being, but a man whose whole life was a struggle towards self-perfection. This struggle is strongly present in his poetry, but above all, there is a very characteristic mixture of harshness and tenderness, of almost rude assertiveness and extreme loving kindness. This makes him human, so close and so lovable, according to the great Czech scholar Kamil Zwelepil. Due to the pervasive influence of Advaita and later Vishishta Advaita, Tamil Bhakti led its followers to a sense of union and identification with the deity. The transcendent was to meet the immanent. In Tamil Bhakti's textually created space, it was one that deftly maneuvered the exigencies and compelling need of popular taste as well as imperial royal ascent of the monarch. In the universe of devotional poetical imagination, the poet was the overlord. Apare kave samsare kavereva prajapati. Devotionalism, bhakti is more than the worship of god or goddess as expressed in poems, songs or rites. The ardent bhakta wants to possess god or goddess and to be possessed by god or goddess. It is thus not unusual to discover a devotee being labeled mad, an idiot or a demon, someone possessed. In devotional Hinduism, gods or goddesses' oneness is stressed at the same time that his or her multiple natures are also emphasized. This suggests that the deity incarnates himself or herself often and in many different forms in a continual process of revelation, according to Olsen. What later colonial era paintings did to the visual conception of deity, the Bhakti verses performed analogous service to the literary conception of God. The sonic ecosystem of devotional Bhakti was pervasive in early modern India. This, according to Kamil's Wellable, was given form, Pavita, through the act of singing. This divinity on demand mode like music on demand, must have proved successful since it shaped the imagination of Southern Bhakti. In a drastic, henotheistic step, God is ontologically willed into existence by an act of imagination, an idiom central to the Tamil Bhakti verse. If you say he exists, he does. His forms are these forms. If you say he does not, his formlessness is of these non-forms. If he has the qualities of existence and non-existence, he is in two states. He who pervades is without end. This is Namalwar, Tiruvai Muri. The deity that is beyond your conceptions has to exist imperatively. It must exist. That deity is both Nirgun and Sagun, in which non-existence and existence coalesce as a result of the textual effect arising from the imaginative effort of the Bhakti poet. For existence and non-existence are themselves the very form of God and whether you say he exists or he does not exist, he still exists. Even where he does not seem to be, he is the inner soul of everything and therefore he exists, according to Doniger. What must it have felt like to be a Tamil Bhakta or devotee to have inhabited its intimate inner space? From textual evidence, it could not have been all conflict-free and pure and organic without grains of doubt and contradiction. The Tamil used often conveys metallic feelings of non-emulsified torment and struggle. I am a puppet made of iron, according to Manikya Vajagar, Tiruvajagar, 522. Imagination remained a therapeutic device. It was like therapy that could offer solace as well as solutions to problems. Bhakti juxtaposed as little as possible between the original devotional impulse and the resultant action. Bhakti disavowed ritual and rendered complexity as simple and translucent. Kamil Zwelebil claims that such sort of imagination was not mystical, elliptical or convoluted, but rather empirical and realistically direct. The Bhakti poets of Telugu, Tamil, and Malayalam languages followed a tradition of yogic imagination that was corporeal, embodied in its contours. The body schema and body image united within the mediational logic of medieval Bhakti.
yogic meditative bhavana imagination is a necessary precursor to the individualized forms of the imaginative faculty that together with other mental functions make up the new meta psychological matrix of late medieval telugu tamil and malayalam sources according to kamil zulabel in kerala sir shall i wind up or with your permission can i go ahead yes thank you sir yogic meditative bhavana is a necessary precursor to the individualized forms of the imaginative faculty that together with other mental functions make up the new meta psychological matrix of late medieval telugu tamil and malayalam sources in kerala it was under the reign of the samutri of calicut that a distinctive malayali culture and consciousness were forged this shared similarities and thematic as well as temporal continuities with minor principalities of tamil telugu and kannada territories forged by soldiers of fortune what has later been perceived as nationalistic consciousness in india must have arisen during this period such self made entrepreneurs many from margins of the social and geopolitical world founded small scale kingdoms which we call nayaka after the warriors who comprised their institutional backbone in the tamil telugu and kannad realms in kerala something similar took place from 15th century on in the so called zamorin state of calicut the first modern state on kerala coast and the arena for the first articulations of a distinctive self conscious malayalam cultural identity powerful thematic continuities bind together the nayaka states of the south and east and the emergent state system of malabar with its innovative poets and scholars indeed throughout south india we discern in this period the lineament of a fresh anthropology and the sometimes implicit sometimes explicit redefinition of what counts as human according to zolabel for champaka lakshmi it was not the text per se but the tamil hindu temple that was the focal point of bhakti they claim that the movement comprising arvar and nayanars were anti brahmanical also does not hold water since many of the poets themselves were brahmans and were not particularly interested in repudiating their privilege so the radical aspect of bhakti though not to be denied has to be taken with a pinch of salt it was more temple centric devotion than marketplace polemic bhakti superstructure in tamil did not reflect its base till later on though poets like tirunavakarasha and nammalvar gave hints of dissent it was hardly a radical reformist movement the protest against orthodox brahmanism was nuanced and difficult to grasp for the present day scholar without twisting the hymns themselves the anti caste nuances in the arvar hymns had a cascading effect that cumulatively resulted in the sri vaishnava philosopher pillai lokacharya who lived in sri rangam in the 13th century denouncing caste in unequivocal terms to think of a devotee in terms of caste varna is said to be a heinous act comparable to examining the gentles one's own mother such a devotee becomes an outcast according to pillai lokacharya the idea conveyed here by pillai lokacharya was more or less that of ramanuja as well bhakti is love and intuitive and organic devotion unctuous and fluid epistemologically bhakti derives from the acquisition of knowledge according to them though this knowledge is devoid of caste connotations and that is significant especially if one is looking to read in medieval saints from caste prejudice in sum with regard to the relationship between the means of salvation karma is the auxiliary means of bhakti although the theories pertaining to the relationship between these means in the thoughts of yamuna and ramanuja are intricate pillai lokacharya's belief is extremely simple and can be illustrated karma gnana bhakti according to the japanese scholar ishitobi the devotionally immersive saints were called arvars aruga in malayalam 
means to be immersed. For our wars, bhakti devotion was its own praxis, practice. Luminescence of the hymns of our wars and nine wars were refracted by the prism of time into various colors of brilliance, some of them emancipatory and polemical and controversial. It was the 13th century panegyrics of some poets like Tiripanalwar that cast them in the role of anti-caste crusaders for present day readers. The songs sung by the Arvars and the Nine Mars have several words which are capable of inciting riot. If Jayalalitha, who is in power today, had ruled in those days, she would have imprisoned the Arvar and Nine Mar. They chanted couplets containing such powerful violence inciting words. O Perumal, lend me your grace to cut off the heads of Shakyas. Tundre Pudi Arvar has openly sung, grant us grace to behead Shakyas and behead Jains in the streets, according to Tirimavalaman. According to R. Champakalakshmi, who has extensively studied the history of medieval southern India and of Tamil Nadu in particular, the idea of a personal deity, antagonism towards Brahmanism, and opposition to Jainism and Buddhism are the major traits of Tamil Bhakti. It is the second theme, namely, protest against orthodox Brahmanism that needs to be examined from the point of view of the social base sought by the exponents of bhakti. Hint of the struggle between the Tamil Hindus and Orthodox Vedic Brahmanas are found in the poetry of Namarvar, Tantarapati, and Madhurakavi, and in the hagiography of the 12th to 13th centuries, as for example, in the story of Tirupanarvar, according to Champakalakshmi. Whatever the anti-Brahmanical credentials of bhakti in Tamil might be, what was not in question was its newness, novelty. Bhakti endeavored towards a more open, more holistic, and less conventionally oriented paradigm. Thus, the Bhakti medium in medieval Hinduism played an important role in the cultural and linguistic spheres, along with the political and social spheres. The Bhakti movement in medieval Hinduism, as much as any other cultural element in medieval Indian society, textured and shaped the culture of the time. In its textual aspects, its devotional hymns and commentaries, the bhakti movement stands opposed to the restrictive structure of society that is expressed in the legal and social texts of the age. The central characteristic of bhakti movement in textual terms is its openness, its universal appeal without regard to caste. Preceding the bhakti movement, there existed in Tamil a strong Siddha tradition. This was an anti-hierarchical and individualistic strain of devotion. Shiva Vakir, a Siddha, is said to have repudiated temple-centric rituals. He exhorted to bath not in temple ponds, but those within their minds. This is moving on so many levels, since the temples were forbidden to outcasts for reasons of so-called purity. The Siddhas were said to have mastered esoteric meditation techniques and who were popularly supposed to have magical powers and healing powers. They denounced the chanting of spells or mandirams, mantra, and followed druidic lifestyle. They were the original Tamil humanists who came from downtrodden castes and strove to reply social oppression with individual enlightenment. To this day, there exists a celebrated Siddha Ashram in Vatakara in Kerala that provide Ayurvedic medical remedies to the needy and indigent poor, irrespective of caste or creed. Man is the measure of all things in bhakti devotion towards the Lord. Yes, Professor. Man is seen as... Hello, sir, shall I wind up? Disagree. Man is seen as the center of all his actions and beliefs. I hope everything is okay. It is okay. Please wind up in two minutes. Okay, sir. Man is seen as the center of all his actions and beliefs. 
They believed that the world is real, not illusory. There is no other universe than the human universe where man determines his actions. The radical endeavor demanded reason for every human action and stressed on the practicability of human belief. By laying the foundation for human self-realization, they developed a hope for social equality through self-realization and self-emancipation. A person shapes her own world where everyone is equal. The person is a practical human who gives up his superstitions, illusions, and has gained reason instead. He is an able person who is capable of solving his own problems and who reveals his human nature. He is a self-deriving human who estranges from desires of accumulation of wealth and possesses alternative values that are against the one that stands for separation of men from men. Gunashegaran. There is a Bhakti parable of a hunter named Kannapa. He is often regarded as the earliest of the 63 Shaivite Bhakti saints. He belonged to subaltern community. According to David Shulman, Bhakti contains a perversive emotionalism in both tone and substance. It would be controversial to say that even saliva could be deemed prasada or divine offering. Satyanath also interrogates the idea of the prasada. Between conjugal partners, it is permissible to pass bodily fluid as it is with one's mother for a child. The practice of consuming leftover is still practiced. Prasada is often goat's saliva fluid. In the Kannapa story, the other arena where this happens is that of the family. Family relations like mother-child, husband-wife are widely popular tropes in Bhakti poetry to connote the deity-devotee relationship. So here, Bhakti, the offering, is a medium. The Czech scholar and linguist Kamil Zolabil advocates a fourfold schema for the study of Bhakti. Historical sociological study, synchronic segmental literary analysis, comparative approach vis-a-vis -vis other kinds of mysticism like Sufi, structural study of Bhakti as sheer poetry. Bhakti was thus a fertile load of literary creativity that interlinked various streams of religious thought and performative practice throughout medieval India. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for an excellent deliberation. And it was very thought provoking. Uh, so uh, we have just received uh, uh, a kind of video of Dr. Uh, uh, Medha. So I would request uh, respected participants to please uh, pay uh, their attention. And uh, I'm just sharing our video. Uh, the video is in Hindi, uh, so if it is uh, okay, then I can also uh, translate that video. How important is it? Why is it important? It is very important to think about it. I think it is the most important thing. But one thing is that it is not that पहली बार भक्ति के बारे में और भक्ति आंदोलन के बारे में सोचा जा रहा है यह सोचने की जरूरत महसूस हो रही है हम अपने इतिहास को निकट इतिहास को भी देखेंगे तो जब-जब देश संघर्ष के दौर से गुजरा है जब-जब हिंदुस्तान पे कोई संकट आया है किसी भी तरह का तो हमें भक्ति की याद आई है भक्ति आंदोलन की याद आई है और संतों की भी याद आई है संतों की बाणियों की उनकी ज्ञान धारा की याद आई है और वहाँ से हमने उड़ा ली है वहाँ से हमने प्रेरणा ली है और अपने संघर्ष को समरसता में बदलने का प्रयास किया है मुझे अभी याद आ रहे हैं महादेव राणा डे जी जो हमारे नवजागरण के महत्वपूर्ण पुरुधाओं में से एक थे और कांग्रेस के संस्थापकों में से भी एक थे वो औपनिवेशिक उपस्थिति या औपनिवेशिक प्रभाव से मुक्त होने के लिए या उस संघर्ष का सामना कर
भक्ति को और को वो बहुत सुंदर ढंग से कहते हैं बार बार कहते हैं कि टू ही मनाईज टू ट्रिचुलाइज दोसाइटी लेकिन यहाँ पे uh, मैं ये कहना चाहूँगी कि पिछले कुछ uh, समय से लगभग पिछले दश, एक दशक से शब्दों का जो है अर्थ संकुचन बहुत तेजी से हुआ है और जो सबसे इस इस प्रक्रिया का जो के जो शब्द सबसे ज़्यादा शिकार हुए हैं उनमें से एक शब्द भक्ति भी है तो भक्ति क्या किसी व्यक्ति की भक्ति क्योंकि आजकल भक्त का अर्थ भी बदल गया है तो मैं यही सोचती हूँ कि भक्त तो हमारे यहाँ तुकाराम थे एक थे जनाबाई थी कबीरदास थे मीरा थी अक्का महादेवी थी ललदेव थे थी तो आज जो किस किस तरह से भक्त शब्द का और भक्ति शब्द का चरण हुआ है तो यहाँ पे हम सब जानते हैं कि ये हमारे लिए भक्ति यहाँ पे उसका क्या अर्थ है लेकिन मैं इसको स्पष्ट करना चाहूँगी बहुत सुंदर ढंग से कबीर कहते हैं और कबीर के यहाँ से चल के ये बात गांधी तक आती है और बिल्कुल एक ही स्वर में संबे स्वर में कहते हैं कि बहुत सुंदर एक पद है कबीर का कि भक्ति का मारक जीना भक्ति का मारक जीना रे नहीं अचाह नहीं चाहना चरणन लो लीना रे साध के सत्संग में रहे निस्दिन मन भीना रे सबद में सुरत ऐसे बसे जैसे जल मीना रे मान मनी को यू तजे जैस जस तेली तेली पीना रे दिया दया छिमा संतोष गही रे अति आधीना रे परमारथ में दे तिसर कछु विलम्ब ना की ना रे कहे कबीर भक्त मत भक्ति का प्रकट कर दी ना रे बिल्कुल इसी तर्ज पे गांधी कहते हैं कि भक्ति वो नहीं है कि हम माला जप रहे हैं भक्ति वो है और वो गीता की व्याख्या करते हुए कहते हैं कि ध्यान योग से ज़्यादा आसान और ज़्यादा ज़रूरी जो है वो भक्ति योग है कि भक्ति योग में जो भक्ति का फल है वो समाज तक पहुंचता है कि भक्ति जो है गांधी के शब्दों में कहे तो मस्तिष्क और हृदय का बहुत सुंदर तालमेल है और कर्म करते हुए ये तालमेल है और उसका असर आपके कर्म पे भी होता है और वो आप आपका कर्म जो है सामाजिक दायरे के लिए हो जाता है वो बहुत सुंदर तरीके से गांधी ने ये कहा है कि कैसे भक्ति के जरिए हम सेवा के भाव में प्रवेश करते हैं उनके लिए कहना है उनके उन्होंने साफ साफ शब्दों में कहा है कि भक्त वो है जो जैसे कि गुरु नानक जी ने, ने कहा है कि निर्भरी है निर्भयी है उसको किसी से ईर्ष्या नहीं हो सकती उसका हृदय हमेशा करुणा से भर, भरा रहेगा उसके लिए क्षमा शीलता सबसे बड़ा मूल्य होगा दूसरे जैसे कि कबीर कह रहे हैं कि परमारत के कारण उनको भक्त को सिर देने में भी कोई संकोच नहीं होगा मिनट नहीं लेगा उसी तरह से कहते हैं रहना ये एक भक्त का मूल्य है वो समाज से कटा हुआ नहीं होता है बल्कि समाज के भीतर व्यक्तिगत और सामाजिक रूपांतरण ये दोनों ही उनका मकसद होता है और वो उसका एक तरह से एकात्म होता है उनके आचरण में तो आज के वक्त में मुझे लगता है कि जब हम बात कर रहे हैं आज की चुनौतियों की तो मुझे तीन चुनौतियां बहुत महत्वपूर्ण लगती है एक तो सह अस्तित्व का
Hello, Ranveer. Is the recording uh, audible? I cannot hear it. No, it's not audible. I cannot hear also. Uh, sorry. It was Is it audible? No, oh, it was not audible. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe we can say the the video yeah. in other yeah. time. Okay. Later, yes. Later, yes. So, dear friends, so dear yeah. friends, yes, Sandeep. So, dear friends, we had a very deep presentation from Dr. Umar. So, let us cultivate some thoughts together, please. Sangeeta, you would have some thoughts, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Omar, thank you for the insightful uh, presentation on bhakti. Um, actually, uh, you had touched upon this um, idea of bhakti as going beyond hierarchy. So uh, I'd like to hear more on that, if you could elaborate on that. And also, um, how would you suggest we can channel this quality in contemporary India? given that uh, a lot of divisions are based on hierarchy and they seem to be made more visible and even emphasized according to the shifting political context. So I just like to hear more on that. Okay, Dr. Umar, you can kindly gather a few more thoughts together and um, then come back uh, with your thoughts. So then uh, other thoughts, please. Okay, Minati, please. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Hello, am I audible? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good evening, everyone. So I would like to thank Dr. Umar Nizaruddin for his very detailed uh, movements of the movement uh, on South India, in South India. So that was really very uh, excellent uh, deliberation. Sorry, but I have few things to just, uh, you know, pardon me my ignorance if I, I mean, just few things I want to know also. Um, you know, according to the Vaishnavites, they say that uh, Bhakti requires a radical reassessment of our deepest desires. You know, that is, uh, so maybe they say, that it is maybe the two, three labels, like something very passing desires. What you see, you immediately desire that. And some medium things, what you just think, or if it does not happen, you leave it. And what is that understanding that deep rooted desires, um, that, is, that is what we, I mean, that is what is called the radical uh, desire is that in the bhakti requires that to look at, look into that. So that uh, for that sense that everything we desire actually definitely it looks attractive. So that uh, he was telling, uh, so I would like him to tell a little bit more about that civilization ethos of people, how it is related to uh, those times uh, Bhakti movement, uh, one thing. And um, another thing I will tell a little bit about that, you know, how the social impact of Bhakti happened uh, that uh, if you see, look at the history, mostly that uh, on this uh, salvation was uh, uh, was dominated by the Brahminical thing and the Vaishyas and the Khatriyas. Sudras and the women were uh, excluded from that. But actually that uh, Bhakti gave, Bhakti movement uh, gave that freedom for the female devotion no? that that um, they could uh, connect themselves to their, mostly not to the God, but something personalized, which you can pursue and do the things. Then um, he was telling about, so just I just I want to know this, about, again, Bhakti movement was a literary movement. The poetry, poetry is the saints, the, the poets, the saints, they all started writing against the social injustice, against the caste hierarchy. The Bhakti movement always challenged it. So how this Tamil Bhakti movement was against Buddhism and Jainism? Because Buddhism and Jainism 
mostly I th I believe that is also a bhakti um, way of uh, I mean uh, this thing they are the human beings. So I would like to ask these two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Minaki, for very deep probing. And uh, further thoughts, Ms. Devendra? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, actually, I listened the deliberations by Dr. Umar, and it was so insightful. I, I uh, as still uh, am seeking to have more knowledge on the subject. So as of now, I would like to appreciate the speaker. Uh, I um, Presently, I have no questions, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tiwari. Yes. And we have with us uh, Sudarshan Bhai, the Sudarshan Jana, who is a very deeply you know, engaged uh, social thinker, activist, and an alternative uh, political articulator. So Sudarshan Bhai, some thoughts, please. Okay, Sudarshan Bhai is taking some time. Uh, Randhi? Uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the very insightful deliberation made by Dr. Kupa. Uh, uh, I think the uh, theory building, it was not done. And uh, I don't know why, because uh, I found very interesting, even in Gandhian insight also, a whole uh, uh, reflexivity of Gandhian understanding or for that matter, uh, the very idea of decolonizing knowledge or uh, inculcating indigenous language for that matter. So those were the very important, insightful uh, thing that Bhakti movement gave. Uh, it was not just for the uh, movement against Brahminical uh, hegemony, it was also a movement against the uh, uh, hegemony of Sanskrit for that matter. When you see the uh, contribution or the uh, uh, Buddha movement for that matter, the development of Pali language, the all the saints they spoke in their indigenous language. Uh, so I think, um, and the kind of history we have, we just uh, understand, uh, you know, it, it, actually it is a British history. You know, they uh, draw the line of Renesia from Raja Ram Mohan Rai. They do not see the important contribution of egalitarian society, uh, you know, the very idea of uh, equality, spirituality, emancipation. That was also during the Bhakti uh, boom. But I don't know why. Uh, our historian for that matter, they do not like it. Uh, my question is, uh, if, I don't know uh, if uh, So thank you, Randeep. The network that is slightly challenging. So now Randeep's question is very deep, and it also reminds me that uh, you know, in terms of dignity of women and uh, you know, fighting gender domination, the Bhakti movement also draws inspiration from Tantra. And speaking of Raja Ramon Roy. Raja Ramon Roy himself draws on both Bhakti and Tantra, as well as multiple traditions of humanity. So that Tantra dimension of uh, Bhakti is something uh, that we need to explore. And Tantra is also a practice of immersion. We emerge inside the whole you know, beauty of togetherness, fire of togetherness. So then, uh, Umar, please, we request your thoughts on this. Thank you, Professor Giri. Uh, the first one from Madam. Let me answer the question about uh, how uh, Bhakti dealt with the question of caste 
because uh, it is a controversial question. And since I am using uh, Slavoj Žižek's method, he also uses the concept of ideology. So the strength and weakness of bhakti is that it it omits the ideology. So the so if you consider caste as an ideology, there is no ideology in bhakti. So Shishik gives the example, you take something, it has a bad aspect. Tobacco contains nicotine or beer contains alcohol or chocolate contains certain unhealthy chemicals. So today what we find is we have alcohol, less beer, beer without alcohol, tobacco without nicotine, and we also have a chocolate that will not hurt your health. So Bhakti at the same time uh, was devoid of ideology. The genius of Bhakti was at the same time, it was its strength and its weakness. And as for today's question, uh, we can say we have moved from a Bhakti religion to ritual religion. Because in ancient India, we had ritual religion. And the religion we see today is totally a bhakti religion. But in contemporary India right now, before our eyes, we are witnessing a radical change where there is an ecological ritual movement. We are going back to the ritual space where the body, yoga, dance practices, all these things um, are getting relevance. I would also uh, like to segue this into Renthir sir's uh, point about you know colonialism and uh, which uh, Professor Grisu magisterially explained about Tantra, the Bodhi. The Bodhi is the capital of the Orient, which has been salvaged from the colonial oppression. So the Bodhi is used in ritual. So the ritual religion uh, is the contemporary answer to caste. Ritual contains possibilities. The Bodhi contains possibilities. The ontology of the body contains the possibilities. And uh, as for the second question, uh, the radical desire, uh, this can be compared to someone like Antigone's desire is the archetypical example we have um, in Western thought. Antigone demands the impossible. So demanding the impossible from the Lord is a question. One has to demand the impossible. So uh, Professor J. Devika, who works on Malayalam literature, calls this pen washi, stri washi, the adamancy, the feminine adamancy, ethical imperative adamancy. And uh, this quality uh, can be found in bhakti, like ma'am has so rightly pointed out. Thank you for that. And as for the intellectualism and uh, the soul of bhakti, it lies more on the side of the heart and the soul. That is why it is contrasted with uh, Jainism and Buddhism, which in a Tamil context are likened to intellectual religions and not religions of love. That is why colonial scholars found a lot of overlap between bhakti religion and Christianity because there is an irrational element of amorous love and affection and affect in bhakti. But on the other hand, the rational, scientific, intellectual mode of Jainism and Buddhism are contrasted against this current. Of course, there would be political reasons for this also. And I'm not an expert on this, to be honest. And thank you so much for that question. And uh, as for NDSS question, of course, it has been you know tackled. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Umar. So now we are being embraced by the beauty of time. <laughs> so the moon in the sky is calling us to look at the sky also and uh, to look at each other as uh, full moon sky. So now Minati, please. 
thank you ananta bhai uh, and you can start. you can open your video okay thank you thank you ananta bhai and uh, i am minati pradhan on behalf of sudhasa chakra and bishwanidam center for asian blossoming would like to thank our chief speaker dr umar nizaruddin for his very insightful and uh, excellent uh, presentation thank you sir i would like to thank dr medha even though she is not present physically i mean virtually she has sent our audio, audio send our video we could hear a little bit and the other things will be benefited later on i think when we get the video more so she was talking something important about the current situation so thank you medha ma'am i thank our moderator professor anand kumar giri for being our mentor for being taking us into the different direction like we are exploring around thank you anand bhai for arranging this type of sessions for us today a special thanks to dr devendra kumar tiwari for being our host and being co present with us in this webinar thank you sir and i would like to thank sangeeta ma'am for her questions and being present with us today in our webinar uh, thank you ma'am and at the last not the least as always our convener uh, professor randir kumar gautam for arranging everything and executing it very punctually i should say so thank you randir and i would like to thank all our zoom platform um, participants and our facebook platform participants for the for your uh, association with us and pardon me if i have forgotten anybody's name and thanks everyone thank you thank you minati thank you